Happy Sunday. We will carry on with our expository preaching and we are reaching the next chapter, 1 Timothy 3. And today's lesson is a tough lesson actually and a lot of things to unpack. So I want to be very careful to deal with it because today's lesson got to do with me. So <laughs> it has to do with the overseer. And there are a lot of lessons here that are that, that actually need quite a bit of time to, to learn and to appreciate. But anyway, let's quickly go through what was taught in the last lesson. In the last lesson, we ended chapter 2 with the Apostle Paul explaining to the church in Ephesus how to run the church, starting from there. So he started with a question relating to the gender roles in public worship, first instructing the men to raise up holy hands and to pray without anything at the back of your mind, like trying to take revenge against someone or quarrelsome and, and stuff like that. So therefore, the kind of standard is really set. But last week's lesson was really, has a lot to do with the subsequent instruction he gave, which is the role of the women. And this is, of course, a tough, tough thing because there are a huge variety of interpretations relating to that. Remember, I was showing you that at the most extreme interpretation, some churches believe that women should just keep their mouth shut, stay in the kitchen, don't teach, don't do anything. And there are churches like that. They wear veil and the women have no roles in public worship. Eh? And they believe that teaching ought to be done only at home and, and not in church and certainly not lead. And then on the other extreme, you have all these many churches where women are doing everything from the key lead all the way to everything. It's the same with men. So this kind of concept is called egalitarianism, which means that anything the man can do, the woman can do and do better too. So many churches uh, on the other extreme will do something like that. Uh, and then I explain to you what's the reform evangelical position. For us, we draw the line at leadership. So in our church, we have no women elders, but we have women deacon, the deaconess. And we also have women preachers like Ibu Maria. However, we do not ordain women preachers to be ministers. So we do believe in male leadership, both at home and also in the church, as in accordance to our understanding of what scripture say. And to understand that further, there were some things that I wanted to show you. I, we wanted to consider three areas. The first will be modern day facts, the modern day factors out there. That the fact is that if you stop all women from teaching, then all the Sunday school will collapse in most churches because women are played played a very important role in teaching Sunday school and also leading. And at the same time, more than half of mission work in the field will end because more than half of missionaries in the field are women. So many churches that claim that they don't allow women to teach actually are not really telling the whole story because they do allow women to teach in Sunday school. So if you want to be very strict about this, then you have to be like the Amish church, which really stay in a community in the middle of nowhere with no running water, no electricity. They live in a commune by themselves. Now, I would say that that's a real kind of extreme interpretation, and at least they are honest with themselves. So therefore, most churches that take a very conservative view, actually, they don't really carry out that view in reality. If not, you know, their Christian education will not work. At the same time, when we look at the writing of the Apostle Paul, it seems very stern and, and very difficult. He said, I don't allow women to, to preach. So the second factor to consider are the historical factors. The Jews and the Greeks, in the time of the Apostle Paul, treated women with a very lowly kind of a status. And so can you imagine you live in a society where women were just considered like objects? And that would influence the way the church has to think and has to move. And it is not like immediately the Apostle Paul will tell them that, okay, everybody should do the same thing as the men, because that will bring up tremendous upheaval in the society. And it's not something that will work anyway. At the same time, I pointed out to you that in the time of the Apostle Paul, places like Corinth and Ephesus were places with a lot of temples of the Greek goddess like Athena and Diana and uh, Aphrodite and all these strange gods. And the, there were many, many women there who were temple prostitutes. And so they were very assertive. They were all people who, who were very loud and go to the street and try to get their temple business or whatever it is. And so together with the idea that women 
in the Jewish and the Greek culture, we're supposed to stay at home and keep quiet. If you find a woman who is very assertive, always wanting to teach, always wanting to stand up in front of other people, very high chance that this woman is a woman of ill repute which means that probably a prostitute or something like that. This is why the Apostle Paul says that women should not braid their hair and adorn themselves with a lot of shining things because this is exactly what these people would do. So that's the historical context that you need to remember. And of course, for us in the Reformed Evangelical Church, it is extremely important to consider, of course, the biblical facts. There is no doubt whatsoever that in the course of the Bible, there were women leaders especially Deborah in the book of Judges. No doubt whatsoever, she was a key lead in Israel. And so at least you have one example of a judge who were ruling for 40 years. It's not just a temporary kind of thing, you know. She was absolutely in charge. And I also listed out to you all the example of women leaders in the Bible. And so when we put all these things together, we believe in complementarianism, which means that we believe that God has created men and women equal in status. This is called ontological equivalence. We are ontologically the same. The word ontologi ontological means in essence, we are the same, but functionally different, but we have different functions. The key problem is that every time we think about all this role thing, we get very upset. We say that, oh, you know, you are the leader, so I'm therefore the slave. It cannot be because the Bible points out that all responsibilities are based on the ultimate love. And the example given to you is the love between a husband and a wife. While we believe that the husband is the head of the household, he is to love his wife the way Jesus Christ loved the church, so much so that he will give his entire life for the church. So for all you husbands out there who think you're a big deal, you have to ask yourself the question, would you give yourself up for your wife? A lot of you were not, right? You wouldn't even make her a cup of coffee or whatever, let alone give her your entire life. So when you understand the basis of complementary kind of a role, then you will understand very clearly and you will accept with full heartedness how this whole arrangement by God would work. And we do accept that there are exceptions in history. The senior pastor said that at a time where male leadership is not effective, historically, God will raise a woman. So therefore, in our church, we do recognize that exceptions occur. So we will commute and have fellowship also with women ministers from other denominations. So there's not a problem for us, so to speak. But I ended the sermon by telling you that actually the bigger issue is obedience to the revealed word of God. And oftentimes, we just don't want to obey. So even though the Bible is quite clear about something, immediately we say, no, we, we don't think that we, this is what I want to do. Or my culture tells me this is not what I want to do. And that's something that we need to reflect upon a lot deeper. So today we will go to the extension of the lesson from public worship, the Apostle Paul then moved on to church governance. How do you really run a church? Remember that the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to Timothy as a pastoral letter because Timothy was a pastor in the church of Ephesus. So very much relevant to us today as well. Let's come to God in the word of prayer and commit the time into his hands. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for this morning. By your grace, we are all here, safe and sound. Help us to appreciate this privilege. For we do live in such a messy and even dangerous world. And yet we are here in such comfort. Help us to appreciate with a heart that is open to you, humbled and teachable. So that this morning will not be a wasteful morning, but a morning where we are enlightened by your true word. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our heart and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For your God and our Redeemer, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, 1 Timothy 3 actually is quite a simple uh, first passage for you to understand. Remember, I once told you that all these various chapters in the Bible are added in by early scribes so that we can refer to the words easier. Letters actually are written one straight line, you know. The roles of men in public worship and women in public worship, generally speaking, he needed to then focus on what are some of the specific uh, out there. So from the verses that earlier our sister Catherine read to us, it's a, it's a very simple kind of concept that he went on to first talk about overseers, 
And then the next message is talk about people whom we today use the word deacons. So I'm going to spend some time trying to unpack it carefully for you. But first, some background consideration about church governance. Together with the interpretation of gender roles, there is also a wide variety of understanding of church governance system. Now, you are in the Reformed Evangelical Church, so there's a particular church governance system that we have, but other people have other systems as well. So again, let us look at the extreme example. And for some of you, this is revision, right? If you attended the Westminster Confession of Faith Shorter Catechism class, we would have touched on this. First of all, the one that a lot of people are familiar with is called Episcopal System. Uh, Episcopal System is a top-down hierarchy system. The best example of an Episcopal Church system would be the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, and many other kind of different churches with a top-down kind of a approach. But the extreme example must be the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in Roman Catholic Church, very complicated and very big system out there. I found a picture that illustrated it quite well. The only thing is that all the people look very grumpy and very unhappy. <laughs> so it's like there's seven layers of rule in the Roman Catholic Church. Starting from the top is God, followed by the Pope, followed by Cardinals. So Singapore's Bishop, Archbishop William Goh is going to be our first Cardinal. Uh, in the history of Singapore. So that's like second layer after the Pope, followed by archbishop, bishops, priests, and then people. But of course, this is a very broad stroke kind of a representation of the Roman Catholic Church. The Inside, the each of the layers is very complicated, you know. Recently, I don't know whether you've been following, there's this scandal in Singapore. Everybody try to guess who that Roman Catholic leader is, right? There's this sex scandal that go on. See, I know uh, if you want to know who this person is, kind of talk to me after service. I, I, yeah, I know. Too bad. Like, I know this gossip, kind of gossipy thing. There, there's a lot of thing about, hey, how come this guy don't have to answer to the Archbishop in Singapore? So that shows you that it is a pretty complicated thing because other than these layers, they also have orders. So the, the sisters, the brothers, and uh, many, many, many different orders. But as you can see, it's a hierarchical situation top-down kind of situation. So when the Roman Catholics gather, it's a very, you know, a lot of riches, a lot of palm and, and, and all kinds of things and colors and what have you. Cardinal is what color? Red. The word cardinal is red. Huh? So cardinal is the second layer. As you see in this picture, the top rank will be the cardinals. Followed by like purple, pink kind of thing. There's an like archbishop and what, what have you. So they got a lot of all these rituals and a lot of traditions involved. A lot of different rings, a lot of different pole. And, you know, it's, it is a very ritualistic thing. So oftentimes I have op opportunity to meet with my Roman Catholic friends. And I will even use the word brothers and sisters referring to a lot of them. And the archbishop will arrive. Wow, it's, it's very big deal, you know. They will go in could see and kiss his ring or and then they use words like your eminence your grace your this your that then for us protestants we just hey what's happening you know <laughs> it's, it's a very different world so that's pretty pretty extreme and on the other side of episcopal system is a system called congregational system where the church <clears throat> really is very independent on its own each congregation self-ruling self-governing self-sustaining independent from others so this is, of course, just a very broad description. Some of the examples are your Baptist church, Brethren church, churches that use the word community, usually a congregationist kind of church. And independent churches are typically congregationist in nature. So uh, all these mega churches you know in Singapore are typically considered congregational churches. And on top of all this, right, so two extreme Episcopal congregation, one top-down, one kind of bottom-up thing. There are also the in-betweens. And we are one of the in-between. This is a mixture of the above. For example, reform churches, churches that use the word reform. So what is the reform tradition? Reform tradition, like the Presbyterians, are typically many independent churches who follow the Presbyterian system, and then they sort of voluntarily come together and be accountable to each other. So the Presbyterian Church formed together to form a Presbytery. Many Presbytery formed together to form a Synod. 
many synod form together to form an assembly. So it's like uh, in between the two systems, right? Not exactly top down, and every church is kind of independent, but at the same time, they are willing to then listen to other churches and be accountable to each other. Again, these are very broad stroke understanding. In between, there are many, many different kinds of variation. In recent years, there have been new emerges, a new kind of churches emerging that are quite fascinating. One of them is a church, or rather a church system started by this guy whom I'm an admirer of, Francis Chan. And I've actually shared about Francis Chan quite a bit. Francis Chan is a, a person who was born in Hong Kong, but grew up in America. And you can YouTube his name and find his preaching quite often. And I do encourage you to listen to some of his preaching. Very fascinating, wonderful, very dynamic kind of a speaker. And, and his thoughts are pretty reformed in nature and definitely not a charismatic guy. So I, I've helped, been helped quite a bit by some of his thinking process. Now, Francis Chan started a church called Cornerstone Church. And the word Cornerstone in Singapore, so there are many Cornerstone churches. So he had one in California. And because of his own dynamism, he's able to grow the church very quickly, you know. So it became a mega church of 5,000 people or so. So can you imagine he has a successful ministry with many campus churches and what have you, dynamic speaker, wonderful. In 2010, he suddenly announced to his church in California that I'm going to quit the mega church. I, I want to go and think about what church movement is all about. And then he later on started this idea called We Are Church. It's very strange. I think grammatically not very correct, right? Those English major people, <laughs> we are Shouldn't it be the church? We are church. So he had this concept. Now, what's this concept? Francis Chan said that when I am preaching to the people, five over thousand people will come and listen to me. And to sustain these five hundred over thousand people, five thousand over people, we have to have a big church building. We have to pay maintenance. We have to go and do all these things. And Francis said that actually, when I look at the Bible, that's not how it should be. You know. Because every single one of the Christians is given gifts by God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and many other passages. So every one of you are supposed to go use your spiritual gifts and be in a community. Not like in a movie house where you sit down and listen to me the way you are doing now, by the way. You know, you, you're just keeping quiet. None of you will raise your hand and ask me a question. I do encourage that, by the way. But then if you do that, uh, our worship starts at 2 p.m. Yeah. I have been to one worship service like this in North Carolina a long time ago. Quite fascinating. It was a very local kind of thing. And then people see around, the pastor is preaching with a can of Coke in his hand. And of course, he's not wearing these. Like, very casual. And then you drink Coke, you talk, preach, preach, preach. And as he preached, people raise hand. Pastor, you said this and that. Why should this be? And then he will respond, no. And then they talk, 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 talk. What is this? Why does the thing take so long? But this could have been the way Jesus Christ taught, right? You read the Bible, Jesus Christ was teaching. People always raise hand and say, good teacher, what do you, this and that, right? But that lifestyle is quite different. Right? They got nothing to do, right? you know, so, <laughs> so it's quite okay. So Francis said that something is wrong in the picture because 5,000 of you are listening to me. It's such a waste of time and effort and talent. Something is wrong with this picture. And so he went off to think about it and he finally started this We Are Church. And I've been observing this and watching this very carefully as to where it is going. Now, what is this We Are Church thing that he was talking about? From his own website, right? The practices of We Are Church uh, in, consist of the following. Number one, devotion to scripture. And we're talking about very serious devotion, similar to our kind of idea. So you don't have to, I don't want to dwell into this further. They're very focused on what the Bible say. The second thing that's unusual is we meet in homes. So the idea of we are church is no church building. They are all meeting at each other's home. And therefore, also, there are no full-time pastors in this concept. Everyone is discipled in that community and everybody is discipling other people. So every single Sunday, you don't come to church. You, you go to your own home and, and somebody is like, like hosting people. It's almost like a cell group concept, right? Except that they're very serious about the idea that everybody must play a role and everybody has gifts and must exercise their gifts within a community. So it's no longer a situation where you come and you, you listen to people like me talk. 
it is a situation where you gather together, you also have to participate and share. It's like cell group, right? you know, but even in cell group, sometimes it's a cell leader who do the lead, right? Then the cell leader keep trying to make you talk and, you know, you what's know, happening and all that. And then you know, your mouth like a goal, right? cannot open. Then we try to pry it open, you know. But in this concept, the idea is that you're all trained to understand that you too is a servant of God. And you're not just a spectator or consumer of faith. You must play a role. You come together as a church kind of a setting. And then, of course, a regular multiplication of churches, plant same concept everywhere. And finally, the gathering are to be simple. Simple gathering, which means that they don't have fancy full music. I mean, you meet in home, you can't. Right? You can't have lighting or what projection, you know, unless your house is very big. <laughs> Most homes are not like that. So can you imagine your house being one of these kind of setup? Again, it's almost like cell group when we meet. You, you can't have very complicated piano or what choir. You know? So it's a very simple kind of concept. I'm very fascinated with this idea and I'm so still observing and watching uh, this movement. This has many, many differences from the way we worship. For example, then you don't have to pay maintenance, right? Because it's your house, right? unless you make yourself member share in your electricity bill, right? which I don't think you will, right? So, and you don't have a full-time staff to maintain too, because everybody has their own job. They are all going out there doing their work. They're coming together and they, they kind of live together. But it also means that each of the church cannot be too big. Correct. Unless your house is really giant-sized mansion house, which I don't think so, right? Assuming it's a four-room flat or five-room flat, how many people can you be squeezed in there? Maybe eight, nine, ten people, but that's it, no? Then after that, you split, you go to the eight, nine, ten people. So it's a fascinating thing to think about and to observe. But if history is any indication, he will fail. Because they, he, he is not the first one who think about something like that. There are many people who sort of think about the same idea. And as you go along, it will not quite work. So it's a pretty complicated issue. Now, also at the same time, there are other different kinds of movement out there. Uh, and in new emergence, there are also other things. Like the most recent would be this idea of church flicks. Now you're familiar with Netflix, right? What's Netflix? This online thing, you go online, you either click law, click, 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 flip, flip, flip. I don't like this program, flip. Don't like program, that flip. Now, with the COVID, apparently, church flix has happened. Because you don't have to come to church, right? So you stay at home, sit on the bed with your underwear, and then you potato chip beside you, beer, and then you click, click, click. Oh, this young thing, quite interesting. Click halfway, I last support. Let's go for Stephen Tong and click. Stephen Tong, not interesting. Let's look for Kong Hee. You click. You know, it, 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 it's a church flix situation that's happening out there. And yeah, there are many people who like clicking here and there, you know. Uh, for us, we... I am very happy that we are able to do live streaming. Last week after worship service, somebody sent me a picture from Scotland and said that, hey, I, mean, we were, I was listening to you earlier. Well, I was quite impressed, man, you know, with me, you know, because, you know, wow, you can, you can broadcast to Scotland. Now, before COVID, it's going to cost you a lot of money, okay, to do all this kind of live, whatever streaming. Now you can, you can reach the whole world. And so church flicks have occurred. And together with church flicks, there are this new movement called the Unchurch, which is the idea that, okay, forget about this church thing. Lah. You just stay at home uh, and have an online community for spiritual what, uh, wanderers. Yeah. So you don't go to church, you just online community. And so they are the Unchurch. Let me be very clear about this. Uh, these two are not church. <laughs> it, it's not correct to say that you belong to a church which virtual and don't exist at all. Because the Bible's teaching is very, very clear. It's about people, not avatars uh, or some virtual character on the internet. No, it's about people. You need to understand that when the Bible says that you have to love one another, there must be another, you know, for you to love. It's not just a concept that is in your mind. But I hope that this very quick introduction will show you that there's really a quick, wide variety of approach out there. Now, why is that the case? Some of the observation would be this. Did you notice that the Bible did not prescribe a detailed church governance structure? 
you notice that the Bible never tell you that, okay, to set up church, number one, go and register with the government. Number two, you will apply for charity status. Number three, make sure you have an elder system followed by, don't have. The Bible does not give any detailed description. It gives a kind of broad descriptions instead. And because of this, therefore, there is a wide variety of understanding and wide variety of practices. And so generally speaking, churches that are very Bible-focused tend to be simpler and loose, more loose in its structure. Whereas churches are very tradition-focused, we include traditions and cultural practices and put a lot of emphasis on it. For example, the way you are dressed. The way I am dressed is pretty conservative because this is a tradition of our church. But the Bible did not say wear a tie and wear a suit, you know. And in fact, you know the, 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 the black thing that I wear with that store thing? Yeah, in the Presbyterian church, they also have that. Among the pastors, they call it the Batman suit. Because you wear a Batman. And I mentioned it once in the, in the pulpit before. And one of the young kids one day saw me, Pastor, are you going to wear Batman today? <laughs> you know, like, that thing is a tradition from the Switzerland, Geneva, when it was very cold. So okay for them to wear that kind. In other weather, come on, you know, it's, it's a very tough thing to do. But if you are stickler to tradition, you get very upset. How come pastor is not wearing the black thing and all that kind of thing? And, and there are some issues related to that. If you ask me, I would rather wear what my pianist is wearing today. Where's my pianist? Yeah, the, the kind of joyful kind of a thing. But there are some practical implication as well, right? For example, as pastor, I have learned that the clergy caller is helpful when people are in need, like they are sick or they need your prayer and all that. To appear with a clergy caller seems to comfort them more. Because if you wear Hawaiian shirt, you know, it's like in Hokkien, it's both me say. So, so they are kind of wisdom in all this, pretty relative in nature. So, therefore, you see that there is a lot of different kind of idea. Because we are reform-based churches, we tend to then focus very much on what the Bible say. But also, as you know, we have traditions as well. So, as it is uh, among all the pastors in our reform evangelical movement, you are looking at the one that they all say, this guy is a liberal. Yong Teng Meng is a liberal. Why? Because I allow my pianist to wear Hawaiian shirt to play the piano. But for some of my co-workers, it's like, <gasps> how come he's not wearing white or black or, or something like that, you know? And, and they, they feel that it's very, very important. But actually, in the reform understanding, traditions are not that big deal. It's mainly on the, the Word of God. So all these are fine things that differ churches from here and there. Now, let's go to see what the Apostle Paul actually was prescribing. The first thing the Apostle Paul says is, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, the English translation of overseer, there are many different translations. Some people use the word bishop, some use elder, some use the word church leader. And in the original Greek, the word episcopes, which means supervisor. Inspector. So Paul is saying this. Now, if anyone among you say that you want to be a church leader, you want to be a supervisor of the church, you want to be a pastor, to put it a very plain way, you want to be a pastor, you desire a noble task. And overseer here, based on other parts of the Bible joined together, means you want to be an elder. So therefore, based on verses like that, the Reformed churches, not only us, Presbyterians and all these churches, believe that elders is the key leader of the church governance system. So we don't have archbishop or the pope or the cardinal. These are, these are tradition, not in the Bible. For most Bible-based churches, elders are then the key lead in the church. And elders are in itself segregated into two groups further. There are teaching elders and there are ruling elders. Typically, a minister like me is considered a teaching elder because I'm teaching you. I'm here teaching you. But at the same time, there are non-full-time people who are elders, who are ruling elders. So ruling elders then run the church. 
So in the Presbyterian Church of Singapore, from which I came, the elders can be very powerful because they can hire and fire the other teaching elder, which is your minister. So that's a Presbyterian kind of elder-led situation coming from the idea of these verses like this. In our church, however, the Reformed Evangelical Church, ours is a kind of a modification. My elders are not going to be able to fire me, actually, unless the other co-workers think so. Because in our system, the servant of God, even though I'm a teaching elder, I am one rank above the ruling elder in our system. Now, in the Presbyterian Church in Singapore system, it's the other way around. The ruling elder is one rank. Not exactly one rank, but has authority over the teaching elder. So you see there's quite a lot of variation out there. For us, we are very influenced by the reform evangelical movement started by the Reverend Dr. Stephen Tong. And so much of this has got to do with his interpretation and his idea about the Bible. So back to the verse then. The Apostle Paul says, if you say you want to be an elder in a church, whether it's a teaching elder or a ruling elder, you are desiring a noble task. What Paul meant is that the task of a church leader, the elder, the pastor, whether you are ruling one or standing here preaching and all that, these are noble and great tasks in the eyes of the Lord. And especially in the Reformed Evangelical Church. We believe that the Hamba Tuhans, the servants of God, have taken on a role that is higher than most other things. One of the clearest examples of this demonstration is when our senior pastor, one of the stories he had was that he met with the ex-president of the Indonesia, right, in one of the talk. Uh, the guy who has only one eye, what's his name? Gusdos, is it? That's his name. That's his nickname, right? I think he passed away. Am I right? Yeah. So they, they were in some kind of conference and they were talking about Indonesian politics and blah, blah, blah. And uh, you know, our senior pastor is very articulate, very convincing. So, and then the ex president was also talking. And so somebody raised a question and said that, hey, look like Stephen Tong and this Gusdos guy, you two can gang up together and run for election and be the next president. Of the Republic of Indonesia. And then Gustav said, Hey, come on, I have already been out of politics for so long. Now you ask me to do this, man, at night I can't sleep because I have to start thinking about this. But when it comes to Stephen Tong, Stephen Tong looked at the questioner and said, Why are you asking me to be demoted from Hamba Tuhan to become president of Indonesia? Do you, do you catch that? He said, Why are you asking me to be demoted? from a servant of God to be the president of the Republic. Ah, so that's the spirit of the Reformed Evangelical. We believe that the servant of God is higher than your president. And that's the understanding that we have. That is quite pretty unique to us. You go to the Presbyterian Church in Singapore, you won't have that concept. Huh? So, and, and this is what the Apostle Paul says. He desire a noble task. However, the question is, why are there so few people seeking this noble task? Few. How do you know there is few? Very simple. If your son or your daughter came to me and said, Daddy, Mommy, when I grow up, I want to be just like Pastor Yong Teng Ming. What would you say? Would you be jumping for joy? Or would you come and call me out and say, you stupid guy, are you now influence my son to want to be like you? Huh? You know how horrible this is? It's a true question, isn't it? It's a tough thing to think about. I will tell you that the first time I saw my late father cry, literally cry, in my life, I've never seen him cry before. The first time I saw him cry was when I told him I want to be a pastor. And they were not tears of joy, you know. He was panicking. He was freaking out. He was saying to me that, my goodness, why in the world you want to throw away your life and... You know, I thought I brought you up better, <laughs> something like that. And my father was a church going Christian. So, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, <laughs> difficult question to answer, right? But let me answer the question for you because, after all, I am the one who is doing this. Why do we not want to do this? Number one, the requirements are actually very stringent. The Apostle Paul says in verse one, trustworthy. Anyone aspire to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Then he lists out all the 
qualification of being that overseer, being that elder. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. You know what's above reproach? Beyond the, the, the accusation of anyone. It's quite similar to our, our ruling party. Huh? They say to join the ruling party, you must be whiter than white. I don't know what whiter than white means. Yeah. The overseer must be whiter than white and whiter than the whiter than white, you know, even more. The husband of one wife, sober minded, self controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Now, I'm not going to go into every single one of these because if not, it will take us until 6, 6 p.m. <laughs> but you, you see highlighting some of the key qualification, right? Husband or one wife is already an indication because at that time, you know, men have many wives. And so this again, bring us back to the original intent of God. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling on to his wife, singular, not cling on to his wives. So here, back to husband or wife, one wife has able to teach. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. So right here, already many of these modern day preachers don't qualify because many of them clearly are lovers of money. You can go and Google, you know, in Nigeria, there are preachers that have five private jets. Five, uh, not one. Uh. One already very incomprehensible. Guy got five, okay? So you you can you imagine and you want to convince me that guy is not a lover of money? Okay, I'm not a lover of money. I'm a lover of private jets. Does that work? It does not work. And then the, he went on to list, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Now, I want to clarify that this applies mainly to children before adulthood. So if you want to be an elder, but your kids are really all horrible and what have you, and especially if they are not adults, then you actually you do not qualify based on 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. However, parents cannot be held accountable for their children forever, you know. So this is another story altogether, right? When a child reaches adulthood, it is their own life. That's why the Bible says, Therefore, a man shall leave his who? father and mother and cling on his wife. That means you have achieved adulthood. Now, that's another topic altogether. I think sometimes you have a problem because some of you keep thinking that little Johnny is still that fellow in the diaper running around, even though he's already 50 years old. You cannot. You have to let the person go. So my response is always that if the person is an adult, then you are not no longer responsible for that person. I remember somebody come and see me and tell me that, you know, my, my, my daughter now got this boyfriend and why have you and I really don't like that guy. I hate his face, blah, blah, blah. Past, and not Christians are more. Pastor, can you please go and break them up? Why well, you know, a pastor, a gangster, what also asked me to do? First question, I asked the mother, how old is this girl? She said 24 years old. I said, too bad. She is an adult. I'm not going to interfere because she has a right. By the way, in case parents you do not know, your kid can go and get married without your permission at that age, you know. All they have to do is go to the hawker center at Red Hill and say, hey, uh, Anyang, you want to be my witness? Huh? Alien, want to be my witness? No, no problem. Just two witnesses and get Yong Teming to be solemnizer, sign, finish, you know. They don't even have to have your permission. That's what adulthood means. So therefore, this verse must apply to children that are still within your management. You bring a child up in the lot, exactly the logic go. You can't even tell your kid to behave. How are you going to manage the household of God? And then the next two verses. He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must not he must be well taught of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So if you were to read through all the verses from two to seven step by step, you know that the qualification is very serious. And so because of that, I suppose a lot of people don't want to be in church leadership. And by that definition also, many church leaders will fail miserably, especially in the West especially pastors who are very rich and my goodness, like money is flowing out of their years kind. And also pastors that have a lot of sexual scandals. In the United States, it's very common. All these public figures, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, all these uh, 
pastors, my goodness, they, they're illegitimate children and stuff like that, you know, and they still can carry on in ministry. This is completely not from the Bible. And one of the things that are very odd, right, when you think about this, when I was preaching to you the last time, we talked about the requirement for salvation. Remember, we were talking about this on the passage about beloved. I mean, I'm a beloved of, of God. The qualification is quite simple, right, to be a Christian. Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Therefore, any human being, you know, doesn't matter whether your race, language, your, your, your color of your skin, whether you're rich, you're poor, you're handsome, you're ugly, you, you, you score straight A or you fail PSLE, it really doesn't matter. All you have to do is truly believe in your heart that Jesus died for you on the cross and was resurrected on the third day. That's all. So the qualification for being a Christian actually is nothing almost, just a sincere heart. However, this does not mean that the kingdom of God has no standard. <laughs> Anybody who is a child of God can just be anything you want. It's actually the other way around. So one of the beautiful Christian hymns is give of your best to the master. Not give of your rest to the master. You always want to give the best to the master because God deserves the best of our resources, the best of our time, the best of our children. The most intelligent child should be given to God in the service of God. That's what it means by giving the best to the Lord. And also God requires this. It's not just deserves it, He requires it. When you look at the Bible, there are many incidents where people take it for granted. Now, today we are absolutely in the, in, the, in the moment of grace by God because we can do all kind of nonsense and God just, you know, leave us alone. Like, you know, so many comedians, they all like crack jokes, you know. If you are there, strike me dead, strike me dead. See, I'm not dead. <laughs> they, they like to do things like that. And these are age of grace. If you look at the Old Testament in particular, oftentimes there were people who worship God and they were irreverent in their heart. Or the when David and his gang carried the Ark of the Covenant, right? Can you remember? You, 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 you take an irreverent attitude, you touch the Ark, you know what will happen? You will get struck there immediately, you know. And, and the holiness of God was manifested truly at that time. The fact remains that God deserves the very best from us. And especially in the Reformed Evangelical Church under the leadership of the Reverend Dr. Stephen Tong, this is brought up at its height. So let me share with you a secret. You want to get Dr. Tong angry, very simple. Let me give you a formula. You go make an appointment to see him. Then you tell him, hey, Dr. Tong, you know my house, uh, I have a piano, you know. And you're getting old. Lah. Now I want to change piano. I want to buy a better piano. Uh, so uh, would the church want my old piano? You go and tell him that. Lah, and you see what will happen to you. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have to, to be there to see what will happen to you. Lah. He will kick your butt, okay, and ask you to get lost from before his eyes. Because for him, you give the best to God. You don't go and give the rest to God. My goodness, I've been working with him since 1997. I see it with my own eyes so often, you know. People come to him and, and you know, wanting to give him a piano or whatever. And these people know, they, they already know. They, they get the brand new piano. I remember one time there was this lady while we were eating crap. Huh? <laughs> she was standing at the side and then keep very scared. So I said, what is this fellow doing down there? Then Dr. Tong said, oh yeah, she's very troublesome. She keeps asking me to go to her house to look at pianos because she says she wants to give the church a piano. I don't have the time for this. So I said, uh, I don't think it's very nice, right? Shouldn't you like... So I said, okay, okay, we go. So after the crap, <laughs> we went to the house with Yaya Ling, Dr. Yaya Ling, the world's number one Chinese conductor. And this woman is very rich, okay? So she got like four grand in the house. So first of all, your house must be super big to have four grand, right? And then I look at Dr. Tong, like, I'm not happy. You go to which one, which one, this one. Dun, 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 dun. I play, okay, yeah, yeah, you go and look at the other one. Play, 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 play. Mm, not very good, I don't like it. Not, God does not deserve this kind of junk German brand. You got Steinway and Sons or not. Uh, this one, it's like, wow. For me, I'll be so happy. You give me a used piano, I'll be very happy, you know. But that's not the thinking, right? The thinking is that God deserves the best. That's why there are a lot of stringent requirements out there for the Lord. And so 
when you think about being an elder or being a pastor, <laughs> you look through the list, right? He's like, wow, I don't think I can make it. It's very tough. The second thing you need to realize is that we are talking about a vocation with very ungodly, uh, unworld, <laughs> unworldly values. The values are not of the world at all. Ministry work is kingdom work. And therefore, with kingdom values, not worldly values. By the way, this applies to all of you, uh, not just about the pastors itself, right? But the pastor will then manifest this at its height. All the issues relating to profit, loss, reward, punishment, joy, sadness, trouble, peace, honor, humiliation, pride, shame, all these considerations, they can be very, very different within a ministry and certainly within a Christian life as well. Yet, all of us do live daily in a world with values that are very different from God's value. And I know you guys know this too, right? I mean, right now you are here listening to me. After that, you're going to go out. Immediately, there are going to be so many voices telling you how to live your life. And it's very tough. So my father can be in church for many years. Once he hears that the son wants to be a pastor, all of a sudden he's like, how, how can this work? Because the value systems are just very, very different. And there are so many differences in the world that we are so used to compartmentalizing our life. So the Americans have a saying, in God, we trust everybody else pay cash. <laughs> so yeah, sure, we trust God. But then, you know, in reality, in life, we need to pay cash. And it, it's, a, it's a tough, tough thing. Not only that, not only the values of the world are different, the Bible really seriously demands the highest from you. One of the more scary verses in the Bible that is seldom preached about is from Luke chapter 17, verse 10, when Jesus talked about the work of the servant. Luke 17, verse 10, Jesus says, So you also, when you have done all that you are commanded, say, We are unworthy servant. We have only done what was our duty. <laughs> so I, I, I work very hard and all that kind of thing. And at the end, I must say, I am an unworthy servant. This is just what I'm supposed to do. Nothing to brag about. Nothing to to be proud about, so to speak. And this is a frightening verse, isn't it? Because for us, it's not how we live, right? We all, we, we all think that people must sayang us, they must praise us, they must at least encourage us, right? And, and that's not how, how we are like. And I'm very influenced by this, you know? So you ask my cell leaders, I don't go in and sayang you, you know? I expect you to go and do your work. And this, of course, in turn, is influenced by Dr. Stephen Tong's style, you know? I think working with him since 1997, the number of times he has praised me publicly must be less than five because I will remember. He's like, oh, your, ice, your heart like eat ice cream, I'm very happy. Because we understand this. So are you prepared to be taken for granted? Doing a thankless job with few material reward because we are not supposed to be lovers of money and often also with few emotional appreciation. So this is the role of the lead, and, and especially in Christian understanding. And it's, a, it's not an easy thing, I will definitely tell you that. In my own lifetime, as it is, I'm a very simple person. I, I grew up poor, so I don't have much inclination towards the trapping of wealth anyway. But still, it can be difficult. I come from an elite school. Not only did I come from an elite school, I was in the elite class of the elite school. So top of the range, so to speak. My oldest daughter has always thought that she will want to be a doctor since she was young. And she always think that that's her dream. She wants to do that. So I told her, you must go to NUS medical school. You know, this is a way. And lo and behold, she didn't get in because it's very tough. You, know, you have to have a good result. You have to pass the interview and then second interview. The worst is to fail the second interview. You know, you fail first interview, still at least got you know, you fail. So she failed first interview. If you pass the first interview and you fail the second interview, it's a very heart-wrenching thing. So in one of my class gathering, I sort of like mentioned this to my friends. You know what happened? Wow, they're all very enthusiastic and very, very encouraging, okay? They quickly go and source all the universities in the world that has medical school. 
And a few of them keep sending me, oh yeah, send your daughter to Scotland. Send your daughter to Ireland. Send your daughter to Melbourne. And don't know what, burn everywhere. Wow, all this, blah, blah, blah. And send the price list. For the first time in my life, I realized that my peers expected me to be able to do that because we were elites. You know what I'm saying? The, the course of action for our life has been very different. They went on to become whatever big deal thing in all the corporation and what have you and make a lot of money, live in big house, and big car, big everything. And they expected me to do the same thing because we were the same, right? We are the same gang of people. And I must tell you that in my heart, I had some sense of tinge of sadness, right? Because to them, it's like that. Then they say, hey, why don't you take this? Why? 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 <laughs> why you don't send your daughter to the acting borough or whatever borough there is, you know? Then you have to say, uh, because I don't have the money. And they're like, how can that be? I thought we are elites. Yeah? So it is a real serious challenge. As if this is not bad enough, let me add one more for you. <laughs> In your second responsive reading today, Patrick is laughing. In your second resp responsive reading today, you read about the Good Shepherd, that great, wonderful passage. If you want to be a elder or pastor or that, you are actually saying that you want to be a shepherd of the flock. That's what it means, you know. You are shepherding them, and we are the small shepherd following the big shepherd, right? What did Jesus Christ say? Jesus said in John chapter ten. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd, what does the good shepherd do? Lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd must love the sheep so much that he is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. Even though the sheep is not thankful to you, take you for granted, to whatever it is. That's what a good shepherd is. The problem is there are a lot of shepherds out there who are not good shepherds. So Jesus Christ described them this way. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. So there are two kinds of elders. There was one time I talked to someone and I, I sort of mentioned, I said, I'm just an elder. That time I was an elder young. And the guy looked at me and said, there are elders and there are elders. Say, so, wow, this is never thought of it that way. Huh? So I tell you the same thing. There are pastors and there are pastors. Different. Because there are people who are higher hand. He flees because he is a higher hand and cares nothing for the sheep. The actual requirement of scripture for all of you who aspire to be in a lead, to be an overseer, to be a pastor, to be an elder, is you must love the people truly. And not Siam Kabehu in Hokkien when problems come and run. And in this, many pastors even will fail. In the most recent turmoil in Hong Kong, for example, I have a lot of my pastor's friends in Hong Kong. Wow, they go up the thing and say, we fight the communist China, blah, 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 and, and encourage people to protest. And they themselves go on the street to protest. And guess what happened? The Communist Party moved in right now and clamped down. Guess what all these pastors do? They tell la, straight away. Oh, God called me to San Francisco. Oh, God called me to Los Angeles. God has called me to Chicago. Pastor Stephen Tong always said, he has never heard people say, God called me to India. God called me to uh, Pakistan. There's always some San Francisco where the team sum very good type, you know. Then you tell. These are called hired hands. They are not true shepherds. I know you sound, you're very judgmental, you say people like that. My goodness, I've seen so many of them. Crazy, you know. Like pastors who retired. I don't understand this. I'm not saying you shouldn't retire, maybe very tired or whatever. But I know pastors who retire and I ask the guy, I say, hey, so what you do now? Ah? Uh, every day, big bread law. I know one guy who say, I got an aquarium, a very big. Ah. Well, every day I make the aquarium very nice. I say, uh, do you do anything for the church? No. I said, don't you teach Sunday school, maybe lead a cell group, maybe visitation? No, I've done enough of that. That's what retirement means. I almost come out with my mouth. Then you are higher hand. I tell you, you want to insult a pastor, say that you are higher hand. You are not a shepherd. But of course, these are not my words, right? These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Well, you were expecting me to encourage you to be a pastor, right? <laughs> <laughs> so why? Why would anyone want to do this kind of job? All these tangles and oh, what nonsense thing. If you if you cannot stand it being taken for granted, you really will find pastoral work very painful because that surely is one of the, the key things. So why do you want to do this? The answer is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, the very first word, because it is indeed a noble task. The Apostle Paul says, this saying is trustworthy. He meant that this is real. This is true. If anyone aspires to be the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Because it is absolutely true that the greatest joy that one can have is to be in the role of serving the Lord. And Paul says, this is trustworthy. This is right. This is true. We read the verse, we say, well, this is trustworthy. Not so simple. He's, he was emphasizing a fact to us all that to be given the privilege to lead the church together with all its difficulties that I mentioned earlier is a noble thing. It's an excellent thing. It's a good thing. It's the best thing, so to speak. To put it in simple terms, the best thing to do in life is to be given the privilege of being an overseer, whether you are ruling elder or teaching elder or whatever it is. In the same token, the best thing to do in life is always to do the things that are related to God. You may not be an elder finally, but whatever it is you do in your life, when it is about God, that's the best thing. And the best thing brings joy that is very, very difficult to describe and explain. John Piper made an entire career out of describing joy. And one of the key verses he used is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you were to ask me why I do what I do, why take all this nonsense from all these people out there? And sometimes it's really quite nonsensical. Recently, I found something quite interesting. You know, I do preach outside from time to time. I was preaching at Orchard Road Presbyterian Church. There is a guy who went to write a very long article and put it on the internet, cursing at me. Wow, all the points he made wrong, la, what mistake, la, this kind of horrible preacher, they talk nonsense, la, 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 in Chinese, la, you know, so you don't understand Mandarin, then you save yourself an interesting essay. And I was like, wow, this guy's very free. Huh? <laughs> First of all, what he said, nonsense, la, I was quite right, and my theology quite okay. It's just that, you know, you know what's a comfort? There's nothing, man. Senior pastor got a lot more. <laughs> a lot more. You go and Google the word Tang Chong Rong, you will see. Wow, just like, so many people cursing at him with long articles and micro-analyzing everything in a wrong way, cursing his Zhu Zhong Si Ba Dai Long Zhong all inside, you know. And you still want to do the job. Why? The answer is that there is great joy in doing what we do. And I will always be doing this, I assure you. And so it also affects my ministry to, in some ways, right? If I invite you to do something for the church, whether it's to lead the cell, to run a music or whatever it is, many people notice that I am not particularly eager about trying to get you. And a lot of the thoughts are inside similar to what Francis Chan is thinking about because I absolutely believe that you guys are very capable people. You can run the cell very well. You can run whatever ministry very well and you are a servant of God yourself. And if you want to come alongside me to do whatever it is that I believe I'm called to lead, that's great. We all journey together, right? If you're not willing, not happy, grumpy, then fine, you know, go and do whatever you want. I don't care. I will always be doing this all my life long, whether it's with you or with someone else. I don't care. You don't want to do it, that's your business. You don't want to help the poor, that's your business. I will always do it all my life long. And do you know why? 
because there are so many occasions where I'm there and I suddenly realize again and again that this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what God has called me to do. And, and this is the fulfillment of the purpose of my life. And the joy is not easy to describe. This is also why I'm not easily impressed. Someone recently was talking to me about all these trappings of wealth, right? This brand, that brand, the house got this, got that. Guy. Then the guy looked at me and said, you, you don't seem to be very impressed. You know, I said, I'm not. Who cares about all these things of yours? Because we are called to have joy in so many other ways. If you don't understand this, you look at it, you say, oh, that's because you have no money. That's why you say things like that. <laughs> and Paul will tell you, this is trustworthy, that this is a noble task, that to be with the Lord is better than anything else. David say, one day in your court is better than an entire lifetime. The second thing is a pragmatic thing, that when I do the work that I do, the impact of doing God's work is also beyond compare and even comprehension. One of the verses in the Bible that is often ignored also is the Bible verse I call a cup of water verse. It is found in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. Jesus Christ, when talking about reward, said, and whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. You know, if I ever start my own church, uh, one of the names I'll consider is called a cup of water church. <laughs> because this particular verse to me is a pivotal verse. A lot of us are out there trying to make a name for ourselves, right? Maybe you have a building name after you or a big deal thing. That's the ultimate. Lah. Maybe you have a country name after you. Maybe you are a researcher. You want a disease name after you. You know, hopefully not a sexually transmitted disease. The Yong Ting Ming STD. <laughs> we think we are that big deal. People remember me. You want to remember my name. There's even a pop song, right? Fame or something like that. People will remember my name. You know what? The Bible says that if you give someone a cup of water, because that guy is a disciple of Christ, and actually by extension of the other Bible verses, anyone, anybody who is in need, just a cup of water, you will not lose your reward. That means that God will remember this. Can you imagine that? God will remember it, you know? You will put your name on some building, right? 100 years later, you think people will remember you? Who is this guy? Uh? Maybe the name all dropped down already. <laughs> and you spend millions of dollars your entire life doing it. This is just a cup of water, man. For goodness sake. And yet the scriptures say people will remember you. So for those of you in finance, the ROI of this uh, hits through the roof. The return of investment kept absolutely out of the roof. So I tell you with true honesty and it's a trustworthy saying, in this room, when I look at all of you, I am absolutely richer than any one of you. By a mile, okay, I tell you. Maybe 10 miles or 100 miles because I understood this since I was very young. So, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, like many things else in life, many of us sit there and listen to this pastor, you say, the guy Xiao and talk all this nonsense, mainly because he's very poor and not a success, so he say things like that. We do not see it because we do not believe, and we are spiritually blind or immature. I guarantee you, once you see it, everything will change. The Bible has so many examples of this, right? That 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 prodigal son who was with the pig, suddenly he see it. The Bible says he came to himself. He suddenly see it. The one that I love best is the example of the Apostle Thomas. Remember in John 20, guy just simply refused to believe, man. After three and a half years with Jesus Christ, people say that, hey, you know, we saw the resurrected Christ. He said, nonsense, man. Unless I put my hand, no, unless I see the mark of his hand, and put my finger in the mark, not enough. Huh? I also want to put my finger on the side where he got pierced. I will never believe. That's what he said. Never. And guess what happened? Jesus appeared to him, right? And our Lord Jesus Christ said to him in John 20, 27, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And there was a moment for Thomas. And unlike the picture, all pictures show him doing it. Act the reality never happened. The apostle Thomas immediately said, My Lord 
am I God? Is there such a moment for you in your life when you get to understand my Lord and my God, where your entire life will change and then you understand why Paul says it is a noble task that you seek after. May we have that moment more often than not and earlier than late so that our life will not be wasted. I say again, it's not just about trying to be a pastor or be an elder. Anything, that cup of water in the name of Jesus, anything you do in your life for the sake of Christ is a noble task. And yet, the calling upon us is so mysterious and so marvelous that Jesus then added one more sentence. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, are you one of these people? You have not seen, yet you believe. If you are, blessed are you. I want to end with this question for you. What then is stopping you from this noble task? Would you look at your life and ask yourself, why is it that I, I'm nowhere near this? What are the obstacles? that prevent me from understanding what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy. That if you should seek to be an overseer, to seek to be closer to God, to seek to do more of God's work, you are seeking a noble task. What is it that is preventing me from understanding this? May you review this in your life and commit to the Lord. And may the Lord appear to you the way he appeared to Thomas, so that you will turn around and say, My Lord and my God, let us pray. We thank you, God, for your word that continue to speak to us throughout all generations and throughout all the days of our life. May we always be faithful and humble in our heart, always prepared to listen to you. May we not be like Thomas who said, I will never ever believe until you will show us physically who you are. Then he will turn around and say, my Lord and my God. Help us to be the more blessed group, believing in your word, for your word is true, that it is trustworthy, that whosoever aspires to do God's work aspires a noble task. May we spend the rest of our life pursuing this noble task so that the joy that our Lord Jesus Christ sought after will be our joy in life as well, that life will be a wonderful journey of knowing that we are fulfilling the purpose that you have made us to be. Whoever we may be, there are always people around us that needs to hear about you, that needs to be touched, that needs to be healed, that needs to be helped in the name of Jesus. Grant us the privilege of knowing this joy beyond all joys of the world so that we will live not just a life, but a life that is abundant and free. Listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.